Hey everyone, have you ever wondered about angels? Those heavenly beings watching over us? Or maybe you've heard about the mysterious Nephilim, giants or something more? The Bible talks about these things, but it can also be confusing. Don't worry, we've all been there. The truth is, some of these concepts are like puzzles with missing pieces. But that doesn't mean there's no meaning to be found. In this video, we're going to explore what the Bible really says about angels, the Nephilim, and this whole Sons of God thing. But more importantly, we're going to discover how it all connects to you and your relationship with God. So buckle up, because we're about to embark on a journey of faith, not formulas. We'll uncover the mysteries, but more importantly, we'll learn how to cultivate a deeper connection with God. Let's do this. The enigmatic figures known as the Nephilim have captured imaginations for millennia. Their origins, shrouded in mystery, have sparked debate and speculation, particularly within the Christian tradition. One prominent interpretation paints them as the monstrous offspring of fallen angels and human women. This view, while not explicitly stated in the canonical Bible, draws inspiration from both scripture and an ancient apocryphal text. The seat of this interpretation lies in a single verse from the book of Genesis. When human beings began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives. Genesis 6 1-2 the ambiguity of the phrase sons of God sets the stage for debate. Traditionally, sons of God could refer to angels, or perhaps even the righteous descendants of Seth, as opposed to the wicked descendants of Cain. Enter the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch, an ancient Jewish religious text excluded from the Christian canon, offers a more radical interpretation. It elaborates on the sons of God as fallen angels, the watchers, who descended to earth and mated with human women. Their monstrous offspring were the Nephilim, depicted as giants of immense strength and wickedness. The Book of Enoch portrays them as a source of violence and corruption, ultimately contributing to the Great Flood. The Nephilim are further described as giants, a concept supported by other passages in the Bible. For instance, the Israelites encounter the Anakim, a race of giants, in the land of Canaan, Numbers 1333. This association with giants lends credence to the idea of the Nephilim as powerful and physically imposing beings. The Book of Enoch goes further, portraying them as monstrous and even violent. Their presence is seen as a catalyst for the moral decay that led to the flood. This interpretation aligns with the theme of God's judgment on sinfulness, a recurring motif in the Bible. Is it canon? It's important to remember that the Book of Enoch is not part of the Christian canon. However, its influence on early Christian thought and literature is undeniable. Some Christian traditions, particularly those with a more literal interpretation of scripture, embrace the view of the Nephilim as the monstrous offspring of fallen angels. Questions remain. While the fallen angels and human women interpretation holds a certain allure, it's not universally accepted. The lack of a definitive answer in the Bible leaves room for other interpretations. Additionally, the Book of Enoch itself raises questions about its historical accuracy and reliability. The true nature of the Nephilim remains shrouded in mystery. Whether they were monstrous beings born of fallen angels, powerful human warriors, or a combination of both, continues to be a topic of debate. Regardless of the interpretation, the story of the Nephilim serves as a reminder of the potential consequences of transgression and the enduring power of God's judgment. The Nephilim, antediluvian warriors or mythical giants? The key to this interpretation lies in the Hebrew word Nephilim. While often translated as giants, it can also signify mighty ones or those who cause others to fall down. This ambiguity allows for a reading that focuses on the Nephilim's strength and dominance rather than necessarily their physical stature. Beyond Genesis. The Bible mentions the Nephilim only a handful of times, most notably in Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of humans, and they bore children to them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. This verse offers a glimpse into the Nephilim's reputation. They were associated with a time before the flood, a period often depicted as one of great violence and wickedness. The Nephilim, then, could be seen as powerful warriors who rose to prominence during this chaotic era. The Bible mentions other races of giants, such as the Anakim encountered by the Israelites in Canaan, Numbers 1333. This recurring theme lends credence to the idea of the Nephilim as a powerful, possibly even physically imposing, human group. However, focusing solely on physical size might be an oversimplification. The Hebrew term Gibberim, often translated as giants in connection with the Nephilim, can also signify warriors or mighty men. This reinforces the interpretation of the Nephilim as formidable warriors who dominated their time. 
understanding the context of the Nephilim is crucial. The Antediluvian period is described as a time of moral decay and increasing violence. The Nephilim, then, could be seen as a reflection of this societal decline. Their dominance might have stemmed not solely from physical strength but also from ruthlessness and disregard for human life. The interpretation of the Nephilim as warriors is not without its challenges. Some argue that the focus on warfare aligns more with later mythological giants than with the limited biblical descriptions. Additionally, alternative interpretations, such as the Nephilim being fallen angels, hold weight within some Christian traditions. Whether the Nephilim were literal giants or simply powerful warriors, their story serves as a reminder of humanity's capacity for violence and the potential consequences of unchecked power. The mention of the Nephilim within a narrative leading to the Great Flood suggests that their dominance did not last. This reinforces the biblical theme of God's ultimate judgment on sin and his power to restore order. The true nature of the Nephilim might forever remain a mystery. However, by examining the possibilities through the lens of language, historical context, and the broader themes of the Bible, we gain a deeper appreciation for the complexities of these enigmatic figures. The concept of sons of God in the Bible can be confusing, especially when associated with angels. Here's a breakdown of the interpretations and the debate surrounding them. Angels as sons of God. In some parts of the Old Testament, sons of God appears alongside sons of men, humans. Passages like Job 1 6 and 2 to 1 describe these sons of God presenting themselves before God, suggesting heavenly beings. This view aligns with the idea of angels as distinct celestial beings serving God. They are considered part of God's heavenly court, similar to sons of a king. Descendants of God's people as sons of God. Other parts of the Bible use sons of God to refer to God's chosen people. For example, Deuteronomy 32 8 uses it for the Israelites. This view emphasizes the special connection between God and his people. Being a son signifies God's favor and protection. The debate in Genesis 6 2. A key point of contention is Genesis 6 2, when human beings began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives. Some interpret sons of God here as fallen angels who mated with human women, leading to the Nephilim, giants, and increased wickedness. Others view sons of God as the descendants of Seth, considered righteous, intermarrying with the wicked descendants of Cain. So, are angels sons of God? The Bible doesn't definitively state whether sons of God always refers to angels. Regardless of the interpretation, the core message remains God's authority and his ultimate judgment on sin. What's important? Whether or not sons of God always refers to angels, the Bible portrays angels as powerful messengers and guardians working under God's command. The Bible offers glimpses into a world beyond our own, filled with angels, the enigmatic Nephilim, and the designation sons of God. These concepts can spark curiosity and debate, but the core message remains focused on God's love, protection, and ultimate judgment. While the specifics of angels and the Nephilim might be open to interpretation, the essence lies in our relationship with God. Angels, whether celestial guardians or symbolic messengers, remind us of God's watchful presence. The story of the Nephilim, regardless of their nature, serves as a cautionary tale about unchecked power, ultimately showcasing God's authority. Instead of dwelling on the mysteries, focus on deepening your connection with God. This isn't about finding formulas or definitive answers, but about cultivating a personal and meaningful relationship. Imagine your life as a garden. Prayer is like watering your relationship with God, nourishing it with gratitude and openness. Scripture reading acts as sunlight, illuminating your path with God's wisdom. Living a virtuous life is like weeding, removing negativity to create space for God's love to blossom. By tending to this garden, you create a space where God's love and guidance can flourish. You might experience a sense of peace after prayer, receive unexpected guidance, or simply feel a renewed sense of purpose. These are all ways God communicates with us, and while angels or the Nephilim might remain intriguing mysteries, the most important relationship is the one you cultivate with God. Embrace the journey of faith, focus on nurturing your connection with God, and allow the mysteries to unfold as your understanding deepens.